this time on Graveyard Cars. Fresh from the flight and exhausted from the SEMA show in Las Vegas, Mark and the Ghouls get back to the grind. Will is amped up to paint his very first 1970 AAR Cuda. This is my first AAR. So AAR is one of my favorite cars. But with Mark micromanaging his methods. I want the top of the fender to look exactly like the rest of the car. Will's rebellious nature is stirred up. <laughs> Meanwhile, Josh is into some heavy metal on another 1970 Cuda. Once believed to be a 440 six barrel automatic, all the evidence is there. Under the layers of rust, something unexpected was revealed. It shouldn't be there at all. If it was a CUDA, they never should have been punched. Now it's up to Mark, Josh, and the rest of the team to save what they can of this less rare but highly desirable 1970 CUDA. We make it look easy because that's our job. Finally, exhausted, overworked, and at his wit's end with Will's defiance. We went over it. We talked about it. I didn't want this transparency here. Mark makes an executive decision. I just need you to be open-minded. That no one sees coming. No way. No way. What are you, what are you doing? There's no accountability because we don't know anything about it. Oh, no. You're not going to. I don't want any part of this. Hey, babe, how was your day? What do I answer? little cars that's in the shop right now is a car that's been here unfortunately for a while is a 1970 AAR Cuda. This car is the F8 green automatic black interior car. If you recall now this is the car that we introduced several years ago where the owner of it now came out and shared some of the backstory of the car with us. My name is uh, Bill Layton. I'm from Sarasota, Florida. Uh, journeyed out to your beautiful state to uh, visit my uh, old girlfriend here. It's an interesting little car. Originally, again, it started life as a EF8 green, the Ivy green, black interior car. It is a numbers matching, 340, six barrel automatic car. Somebody had done a color change, apparently somewhere along the line, like many times, green wasn't a popular color, so people would change it. It's really a substandard paint job that's on the car, and it was probably substandard then. But an interesting thing is, they masked off very strategically all of the strobe stripes and the badge for the AAR, as well as the blackout that you would get on the tops of the fenders, the hood, the tops of the doors, that kind of stuff. It's, uh, it's just one that had been really neglected before it got parked, then parked for a long, long time, and then finally got its chance at coming back to life. This is a pretty original car other than the color and the front seats had been changed out. It still had its original carburetors, air cleaner, exhaust manifolds, correct radiator. Those are things that usually grow legs over the years. They were all here on this car. The interior, other than the front seats being changed out for a 73, 74 style E-body, which I don't know why that would happen. It was all very original. Uh, I believe, if I'm remembering right, even one of the megaphone exhaust tips was still on the car. So another thing that you usually see missing on these cars was the 15 by seven rally wheels. And most of the time people take them off, they want a, a Krager, a second day add-on type of a wheel. But this one still had the 15 sevens with the original center caps and beauty rings, even though we'll have to restore them, at least they're there to restore. It started out here at least as a good, complete project. So on the interior of the car, Again, very complete. This was a standard instrument panel. It didn't option out the A62 Rally instrument panel. So it was the standard one with the big, big speedometer and the three small gauges. Somebody had changed out the original steering wheel to the 72 to 74 style, which I just don't think is a good looking wheel at all, but that's what was in there. And probably the same car that donated that steering wheel donated a pair of front bucket seats, which I again don't know why, unless the original ones were stolen, perhaps, the 70 style, because the 70 style is a much better looking seat than the 72 to 74 style, but that was what was in it. But other than that, a very good, complete interior. 
You know, so this is my first AAR. Um, so it's always exciting when you do something different. I love the blackouts. AAR is one of my favorite cars. I like the stripes, the strobe stripes that go down the side. And I love the flat black hood that runs along the top of the fenders. So it's kind of unique, but I, I, I've always liked those cars. So this is exciting because it's the first one I've done, but I think this is the second one the show has done. Mark did one years back, lemon twist yellow one. Body and paint only, built the drivetrain, then handed it all over to the owner to assemble it all. And that was a gorgeous car because the contrast of the black, the flat black and the yellow really pop. It was FY1 Lemon Twist Yellow. On this one I did, while it's still pretty, it's a dark green car, so the contrast isn't as much as the other one. Like I say, the AAR was absolutely stunning when it was done. It was one of the cars that I personally wanted to deliver to the owner. I've only done that a few times in Graveyard Cars history, but one thing is he lived in Portland, which is a couple hours from here. And so I loaded that up uh, with my nemesis at the time, and we took it up to his place. Had a really cool Hot Wheels track that we got to play at while we were up there and check out the rest of his collection. Two Challengers, two 71s. Uh, two identical like. 71 Challenger Hemi cars. Well, they're both shakers now. You sure mine's a Hemi? Well, it might be, it might not be. So yeah, mine I might will... be a 340 and you got the Hemi, I see. Okay, that's fine. Know. that's fine. But you can choose. Okay. Yeah, choose which one you like. Okay, I'm gonna choose this one because you set this one closer to me to dupe me. Oh, clever. All right. A coin toss to see who gets lane choice. Heads. It heads. is heads. Of course it is. This is my day, I told you. I red lighted. All right, Mark's up one. Okay, all right, that's what I'm talking about. Right there. That's one. Oh. Well, hello, ladies. <laughs> what uh, What happened there? You, you called me on the 340 Challenger. I did, you yeah. thought you had me, didn't you? I did. Gotta get up a little earlier than that to beat the kid. Did oh. I red light? That was a green light. Huh. Wow, Mark, I'm impressed. Huh. Today is your day. I cannot beat you today. Huh. Huh. Well, well done. Thank you, my friend. But again, what a beautiful combination that AAR is in yellow and black. Today I'm getting ready to paint our 1970 Cuda. It's an AAR going F8 green. This is the third or fourth time I've done this color, which was a pretty color when you do it once, but then when you do it over and over, it's kind of locks its luster. But it is the first AAR I've done, and I think it's the second one here at the shop that we've done. So it'll be a gorgeous car. The hood goes flat black. The tops of the fenders go flat black. And it actually carries down. Dude, what are you doing? I'm a pretty simple guy. You know, I, I come to work, do what I'm supposed to do. I just want to paint cars. I don't need coached up. I don't need to talk. I don't need any distractions. It's just let me get my 13 cars a year done and be left alone. So being an AAR, you know the tops of the fenders, the tops of the doors, and the tops of the quarters get the organosol black, which should theoretically match the hood. Right. What I don't want to see happen is where you paint the fender real nice from here down because you know you're going to do the black up mm -hmm. here. I want the top of the fender to look exactly like the rest of the car. And I'd like to clear the air on one thing. These tune-up talks that I have with my employees, Will, is not because I want to showboat or I want to go in there and get my face on camera. I can get on camera anytime I own the show. Okay, I created it. I can do whatever I want. I have those talks with Will because I want him to do his job. I want him to follow the outline of the things that I want done. He likes to sidestep. That's he's a he's a habitual sidestepper. Okay, he will take a car that gets a vinyl top and not put color all the way across the roof of it. Why? Same thing in this particular case where you've got the tops of the fenders and the tops of the doors and the tops of the quarters that should be black. Make sure you got the green all the way over there. Why? Because I want it. I don't have to explain myself, it's what I want. My job is to make sure he does his job. So call it a tune-up talk, whatever, that's why. Then paint the whole fender green. Yeah. Okay, do you know where the break is yeah. when it comes time to do the black? Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. 
you know for a fact that whether it goes all the way through the, Actually, the fender inner uh, double bolt pattern area, if it goes yeah, through both of them or just one? You know, this is this is 27 years. It's it's exhausting. You guys at home, you you see it and you laugh and you joke and oh, Mark's hilarious. And it is, but it's not. So I just want to make sure that you understand. I want full paint here. I want full paint here. Do you have any idea how many of these were even made? Give me a number. How many do you think made total AARs? Just give me a number. 200. Uh, 2,724. Oh. Now, the reason I rattle off the numbers on a car like this is it's rare. People get in a habit of just thinking it's a Roadrunner, or it's a Cooter, it's a Challenger. It's rare. It's a rare piece of history, and we should want to preserve it. We should want to do the very best job humanly imaginable on that car because it's a rare part of our heritage. All I wanted to say was it's an AAR. You know it doesn't get any blackout back here. It doesn't even get a decal. It doesn't get anything on it. Oh, you know that. Yeah, I guess Oh, that. I had no idea you know that. Well, then you should know this. See what my daughter got me? You know, he's all over the place. You know, it's from making sure you get enough color on this roof, even though it's gonna get covered by a vinyl top and you've still clear coated it, to the next day, Alyssa buying him a number one dad shirt, which is the furthest thing from, it should be like 10. Has Layla bought you a shirt? Just two. Well, I'm the number one dad. Yeah, it's not the same so. when you buy it yourself. I'm gonna go talk to Brody right now, which is a bizarre name to name anybody. You know what my grandson's name is? Giannis. It means God is gracious. What does Brody mean? It's to do a cookie in a car. Uh, once I finally got rid of that crazy lunatic mark, I can finally get going. And no, I'm not gonna, the parts that go black, I'm not gonna cover them in green. It's a real thing that there's a raw material shortage. So all the paint that I can save, the better off we'll be. I don't know if you guys remember last season, but my dad and I walked around a 1970 440 six barrel Cuda. Um, this one was a little tricky because all the body numbers, the fender tag and the VIN matched. But we did figure out that it wasn't real. I think it was the first episode of the season. 1970 Cuda 440 six barrels, one of the monochromatic rubber bumper cars, red, if you recall, red interior. We sent it out, had it dipped, it came back and I noticed things were wrong with it. Things that made me believe perhaps it wasn't exactly what it should be or what it was represented to be. And so it was an opportunity for me to spend time with Alyssa, going around the car, showing her what to look for. When I, when I, something doesn't pass a smell test with me, why is that? Well, it's a few things at one time, but things that you can see that I can point out are how a weld doesn't look proper. The formation of the metal doesn't look like it was done on an assembly line. It looks like it was done after the fact. And so that was my chance to go around with her and let her see that whether there was a nefarious reason behind it or not, it still is a car that was made up of two cars. So when all the paint and all the filler and everything's off these cars, you can see it all. That's what I'm talking about. You can go up to that front inner structure like I did and run your finger up and down it and see where somebody has put a panel on after the factory where somebody has sectioned a firewall into an apron after the factory, or an upper cowl panel or cowl side panel that had been changed after the factory, a core support that one side looks right on it, the other side doesn't. Here's the rear body panel. Here's the trunk gutter, which welds to the quarters, which makes up the shell. Do those spot welds all look pretty original and unmanipulated to you? I would say yes. I would say yes too. Go back to the back of the car, it's the same kind of a problem. You've got a 70 Barracuda Grand Coupe rear body panel on it. All the evidence is there. Grand Coupe crest, Barracuda emblems that have holes welded where those emblems would go very nicely, but shouldn't be there at all. If it was a Cuda, they never should have been punched. Is there any chance that those three holes? It like matches up perfect. See what I'm getting at? Yeah. Somebody's welded all those holes up and they put a double stick Cuda emblem on there, but there's more evidence. Because it's a Grand Coupe, this is the Grand Coupe crest. Okay. It goes over the trunk lock cylinder, 
and you oh, slide it gosh. over to the as side. As soon as you put it up. One of the most fascinating things about this for me was when my dad showed me that the donor car that was used for this was actually a Grand Coupe. There are so many markers on this car that didn't add up, and if this car had been painted, you would have never seen any of this stuff. Vinyl top moldings for a car that's not coated for a vinyl top. Vinyl top holes for the molding for a car that's not coated for a vinyl top. And the list went on and on. And then we can mathematically back all that stuff out and come up with the decision that I had to painstakingly make on that car. So the smoking gun in that case that led me to my decision was the fact that the last eight characters of the vehicle identification number reside in that upper cowl panel, the one that matched the original fender tag and dash. Same thing with the radiator support, matched the fender tag, match the dash. All the rest of the car could be anything and nobody in the world would know if you didn't know how to look for the DNA markers that represent that car to be a full 46 barrel car when it started life or not. It looked like the firewall and cowl and radiator upper tie bar and one baffle were original from that car, from the 446 barrel car. At least the majority of the rest of it was 1970 Barracuda Grand Coupe. So once I had come to the conclusion that the car had been made up of two different cars, I had to report that to the owner. It's my job, it's not much fun. Very nice man, shocked, and I believe it wholeheartedly, because he bought the car that way. He was very disappointed, really kind of heart sick, as you would be if you spent a lot of money on a car that just wasn't a real car, or at least I couldn't help represent it as a real car. But you know, we talked it through, and I gave him all the alternative. I said, you know, we can stop now, and if you have any deposit coming back, I'd be happy to refund you. If, if you want to move forward with it, I'm happy to move forward and continue to make it look like a 1970 446 barrel automatic CUDA, but do it correctly. Put all the markers in it so it is a good tribute car. That's the important thing. As long as he knows it's a tribute, and I know it's a tribute, and America knows it's a tribute, and I have a documented file, then no harm, no foul. Another big problem with the car was that a lot of the panels and a lot of the work that had been done really wasn't up to our standards or really what I would consider to be industry standards. You know, starting at the back, you had frame rails with kinks in them from a previous accident. The right rocker had been replaced by somebody else and didn't do a very good job. The right hinge pillar had been replaced and not done a very good job on it. And so it was gonna affect the geometry of the car. These are structural components. So I thought, well, if we're gonna put our badge on this one, then let's do just what I said to the owner. Let's make it right no matter what. So I had Josh, the metal guy, get started on replacing the outer rocker, repairing the inner rocker, and replacing the inner and outer right hinge pillars. So because it had had previous impact to the right rocker and right hinge pillar, parts of it looked as though they had been replaced, and other parts of it looked like they had uh, tried to repair it and pull it. And so, you know, that's kind of why we came up with the idea that it needed to be replaced and done right. I think we could have mudded over it and they'd have never known it. I mean, that's what somebody did before. But these are key pieces on a unibody to the structural integrity of the car. That outer and inner rocker and outer and inner pillars, they make up a big part of the structure of the center cabin of that car. In addition to the hinge pillar being a big part of the unibody structure, it also determines where the doors are gonna sit. So it's very crucial that you take your time when you're doing one of these hinge pillars and you measure it very carefully. If you do it right, it'll end up perfect in the end. But if you don't measure where it needs to go, you can have a door that's trying to sit too far forward, too far back, or even too far out compared to the fender. So it isn't just the fact that the panels are replaced on there or that they're in good shape, it's how they're welded together, the spot welding or the MIG welding when you have to do that. All of the pieces, the right outer rocker, the right inner rocker, the right hinge pillar, inner and outer, the upper cowl panel, lower cowl panel, plenum, aprons, frame rails, core support, quarter panels, B pillars, C pillars on some cars, inner and outer wheel houses, trunk floor extensions, all that stuff by itself offers nothing in the way of structural integrity. And it adds no strength to anything. But when they're bound together, it becomes like the wall that's laying down on a house that they're building. By itself, it goes up and they have to brace it. 
but by the time they put the other wall up against it and the third wall and the fourth wall, it's solid. Then they put the trusses on the top and that holds it together and that has all of its side force ability to withstand side force, uh, wind and earthquakes. All of those things make up the structural integrity of the car. Still to come, when Mark agrees to talk money for new gear with the show's senior executive producer, the wheels come completely off the cart. Mark just lost it. Meanwhile, more metal with Mark and Josh, tearing in to unseen depths of this Frankenstein 1970 Cuda. This is the very first time I ever remember doing a repair like this. Butter, baby, butter. To ultimately pay tribute to the 7440 six barrel Cuda it should have been. There's a lot goes into making it look easy. Finally, Will's defiance is driving Mark to his wit's end. Code red. But is Mark's most senior employee going to survive GYC's newest shop foreman? No way, no way. What are you, what are you doing? There's no accountability because we don't know anything about it. Oh no. When Graveyard Cars returns. Are you guys just like a little freaked out? First off, I want you to know that I think that the budget and you wanting to do new computers is a great idea. So Mark called me in for a budget meeting, which is great, surprising, but great, because I've been bugging him about computers and a bunch of other equipment lately. And whenever I ask him for anything that revolves around money, he typically doesn't want to talk about it. So when he said, hey, let's do a budget meeting, I thought we need to have cameras in here because I want to capture what happens. Mark usually operates in layers, like layer one is what you think he's offering you, and then all the subsequent layers are everything that he's trying to get out of the meeting or the deal or whatever. So, so we'll see. I can't commit to it right now because I'd really like to see what the total dollar amount is for all the computers. You don't need to look around silly and play for the camera because nobody cares at home. This is legitimate. You wanted it in here, it's in here, okay? I want him to see what I have to deal with. Yeah, okay, no, it was a budget meeting, arguably, for maybe the first 90 seconds. But no, after that, yeah, Mark just lost it. He he went off the rails. What I'm having the most difficulty with is people following instructions. Mm -hmm. Recently went through a great big thing with Will on this AAR Cuda that I asked him specifically to make sure that he painted all the way over to the hood. Right. With the color, even though it's gonna get blacked out and he agreed that he would do it, but he didn't. Do you uh, have anything like that at all up here? A couple times? Yeah, you know? yeah. The same not painting, thing. they're not painting. Sure. But maybe you tell them to do something specific. Yeah, and they kind of, Forget. Yeah, forget. Yeah. Right. All right. So, yeah, the first layer is peeled away. It's not really exactly going to be a budget meeting after all. Big shock. But what was weird is Mark is asking me about management stuff. And I know he's had some problems with Will and a few other guys kind of doing their own things. So he wanted to talk to me about techniques and, and, and how to deal with employees not doing what they're told. I got an idea to help him not forget. And this is where I just need you to be open minded. Did you ever see an episode? of Saturday Night Live where Hugh Jackman hosted the show. What on earth does SNL have to do with anything, with budgets, with, with, with management, with anything graveyard cars? Why? I don't oh. recall. Okay, no problem. It's a sketch where Will Ferrell has his kids for Christmas. I guess this is a real story. So instead of Santa Claus, they have Freckles, a Christmas kangaroo. Then you have to fight him for your gifts. And then if you fight him and you win, you get all the gifts. And then if you don't, Look, Freckles has a job. If I tell you to do something, you decide on your own that you don't want to do it. Let's say, for example, it's painting the top half of a car because it's going to get blacked out. Well, I think maybe Freckles ought to be involved in that. No, 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 yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I want to get a costume. Oh, no. A Freckles costume. No. Oh, gosh, no. But they don't know who's in the Freckles costume. And there's no accountability. <sighs> if you think about it, there's no accountability because we don't know anything about it. A shop foreman in a kangaroo outfit. But a serious kangaroo. Somebody that goes around and enforces the law. What is their method of enforcement? Because, I mean, I'm recalling the sketch now. Oh, you can't do what's in the sketch because that... Mm, no. No, I don't even no. want to have anything to... What, they're going to beat them up. Yeah, just little things. Intimidating. Not really bust them up, but some, some punches. Some things that make them feel awkward enough that they'll follow the rules next time. How much is this thing going to cost? That's not the point. Money's rarely an object when it comes to creativity. Yeah, unless creativity is new computers or new equipment to make a better show. Now, I'm also thinking, along with it, because the audience may not get it, is 
The one thing that is consistent with these meetings is I always come out of them wondering why. Why did we have the meeting? Why does Mark do this? Why does he sit up late at night watching TV shows and movies and just purloining every little thing that he thinks is amusing and trying to inject it into the show? That's a big why. But the other big why is why would he come up to me with Will's problem behavior and want to get my opinion? And this is the next layer. Peel that away, and now we know exactly what this whole thing's about. It's not about budgets, it's not about management, it's not about a stuffed kangaroo outfit that boxes. It is about... What if we threw a laugh track in? Oh no. No, I'm not gonna run around the shop dressed up like a freaking kangaroo threatening to violently assault somebody, all right? But if I know in their mind they believe that's an alternative, to giving me my laugh track, which I think is a brilliant idea, and you guys will see soon enough, um, then so be it, you know? But I think I'm gonna look out a little more common sense than to run around the shop in a kangaroo outfit threatening to beat people up. In fact, I'm, quite frankly, I'm insulted that they would even suggest that. You think Dougie is gonna run up and get together with Wills and talk about it? They're gonna think he's lost his mind, like Harvey, the six foot rabbit. You're not serious about this. Can't get rid, right? Like, well, let me ask you, do I get the laugh track? So for those of you who have not had the immense pleasure of working with Mark for the last 15 years, here is how it goes down. This is called a Hobson's choice. It is not a choice. It is an illusion of choice. Mark has layers. He offers you something, and then below that are the layers that you think he wants, but then he gets you again with another layer, because at his heart, he's a used car salesman, and he's gonna get you every single time. This was not a choice. This was malevolent marsupial or a laugh track. I'm sorry, but it's a laugh track. Okay. I guess I will call an azure meeting. Okay. Appreciate your time. And Mind if I grab my drink? Appreciate yours. My beverage. And one of those. Yep. So. All right, no freckles. Are you guys just like a little freaked out? So I'm gonna go ahead, screw this new piece on, and I'm gonna take a couple measurements, compare them to what I was looking for, and uh, go from there, I'll get her welded up. Yeah, that's looking perfect. It's got a 1,490 mils. So this thing's gonna line up really good once it's done. So now this is how the hinge pillar and the rocker should be welded into place. This is what they should look like when you're done. When you have it like this, you know that you have good penetration of the metal. You know that everything that was once two pieces is now one, which again, is the structural integrity. And then taking the time to align it like this and knowing where this pillar is in space relative to the car is the most important. And that's what he's nailed completely perfectly because that door fits like a glove. The correct gap at the back, the correct gap at the bottom, the correct gap against the fender, that's gold. What I don't understand is we went over it. We talked about it. I didn't want this transparency here. Right. I wanted to pretend just like it wasn't gonna get a blackout. Right. Now this is exactly what I was talking about with Aaron about not following the orders. What happened when William T. Santiago disobeyed an order? Huh? Code red. Well, this is code freckles. Maybe I call it code freck. If I order a code freck on somebody, what's gonna happen, huh? And here I am looking at it and it's transparent. So, okay, I'm gonna say that you made that decision all on your own. That's fair. Think of it like this. Pain's running around $1,000 a gallon. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money out of Mark's pocket, customer's pocket. So everybody wins if I don't paint a roof or if it's covered, I don't put color up there. And I clear coat the roof so it's protected and we have no issues. And Mark just doesn't realize by saving it now is gonna benefit him later. I can put all that paint on there, but it's gonna get covered up so there's really no point. So here I am looking at a transparent job. I can't tell, this looks transparent to me. Oh, don't because be of over that, dramatic. Looks, don't this looks even, transparent. I know what you're doing. It starts to glow, I can't no, tell. Yeah. Why would you select between that panel and that panel? No. We, you can clearly see it's covered here, it's not here. But what about here? This oh, looks kind of halo and shadowy to no. me because this, I believe it isn't. Oh, I know I completely not. believe it yeah. isn't. Good Let thing. me ask you this, have you ever seen Saturday Night Live?
So we've got our, I, I'm gonna call it an original firewall. We established before that this firewall is off of a different car than the rest of the body is. Everybody's aware of all that stuff. We decided we'd save the original replacement firewall. So this is what you saw when the car first came back from dipping. It's everything from there forward that's been replaced. And we did that because whoever had welded the front clip on this other car before didn't weld it on straight. The car had been damaged before. So it had a multitude of problems that gave us terrible geometry. So with that and with the existing problems that the aprons and her fenders had when we go through and show how wadded up they were, how terrible the welding was, we just decided to put everything on new from the firewall forward. So that's why you have a right and left inner fender. Shock towers are the original shock towers that came back from the dipper. Whether they started life on the car or not, we don't know. But the shock towers are, that's why they got that primer on them. So the right hand frame rail and the left hand frame rail, brand new AMD frame rails, all installed. If you look now compared to the original welding that was done on the car, check out the spot welds that Josh did. He's real proud of these because he takes a lot of time to duplicate the original look all the way through. Remember how wadded up the other ones were? Look how nice and clean and sanitary all the welding is. Same thing there. Walk down that vertical, across the bottom, up around the shock tower, up around the back where the supports meet the apron. Beautiful. We have a new core support. We don't care about the other core support because those numbers didn't really belong in the car. So this is a brand new 26 inch opening. It's an AMD core support, both upper and lower. It's two piece set. But you can see again, this is another section where they do the welding. Welding there. Here where it intersects, you have nice welding here, nice welding over there. So everything literally from the firewall forward, except for these stiffener brackets, and the shock towers are brand new. So with all that stuff done, Josh has got the back end ready to go. And so what we're gonna do on that's a little bit different than what we've done in the past on these cars. So I just wanna take a minute and walk you through that. So now typically when we're replacing frame rails on one of these cars, like you've seen in the past many times, the whole car's rotted out. Everything's destroyed on it. So we have the floor pan, under seat pan, main pan, trunk floor, extensions, quarter panels, everything's off the car. But this one had a pretty good body. The donor body that they got to make this car was a pretty good body. So we don't want to replace all that stuff. That's why we're doing the rails the way that we're doing them now. So basically you had to take the torque boxes, the spring hangers where they weld in here, all loose. So some of the things that makes removing this trunk floor so difficult compared to what we usually do is the fact that we're trying to save a lot of stuff. Typically, we take off quarter panels because they already need replaced. We're taking off taillight panels because they need replaced. But that's not the case with this car. So you've got all the spot wells out where this frame rail meets the step wells, the under seat pan, and all of the trunk pan, right? right. You have one or two spot welds that you've marked here that you want. Yeah, I got to one spot weld on each rail. Just so. holding it. So your goal or your hope is that when that comes out of there, I can pull that rail out from underneath this torque box area over. You maybe have to break a couple of more straggler welds loose. Right. And then we can take that rail out and set it on the ground. Same thing with this side. And when we do that, we're gonna be able to replace it with brand new AMD rails. That's yeah. the good news. But not having to replace the quarter panels or take them off, because these are good other right. than a small section. All right, like let's plans. do it. So I just scratched my head a little bit and to take a little bit of time to figure out how to do this because typically this is different than the way we do it. So I had to stand back, figure out exactly what's going to happen when I remove a certain part and other ways to get some other parts out that would still make it where I could save all the other stuff. Now this is the very first time I ever remember doing a repair like this. You know, typically a car comes to us, it's rotted beyond recognition. There's nothing left of it. By the time we cut all of the old metal off of the car, we end up usually with not much more than uh, quarter reinforcements, maybe a rocker or two, a roof. That's usually it because the front end's gone, the back end's gone. In this case, we had good quarters, really good usable quarters. All right, so this one, if it goes as easy as the other one, we're, we're gold. And the rear body panel was good. So we weren't taking everything apart. We weren't dissecting the car. So this to me is the first time I can remember ever doing a repair like this, but it's very, very sanitary when it's done. 
Very rarely do we ever have to do it, but I love knowing that we got the chops and can do it because that is a hard one to do, to measure and plot ahead Ooh. the way he did. That one a little more than the other one, but that's okay. I love it. Once we actually had the rails out of the car and on the ground, you could get a good clear view of the trunk floor. You can even see exactly where the rails were when we did our etch priming with the epoxy. We weren't originally going to replace the trunk floor, but because we got to looking at all of the pitting in it and how much filler it would have took to make it look right, to make it look correct, and knowing that a trunk, for whatever reason, seems to absorb moisture and moisture is bad for filler, I just decided that the best repair would be to replace the trunk floor itself, the center section. Now is a great time because you already have the rails out of the way. Day two, Mark and Josh forge ahead with a mountain of metalwork on the Tribute 1970 440 six barrel Cuda. It's not the kind of thing that somebody would want to try in their garage. But will Mark's defiant decision to take editorial and managerial control go to his head? Mm, no. No. And finally, push everyone at the shop to their breaking points. I don't have to explain myself. It's what I want. Find out when Graveyard Cars returns. What are you doing? Right now, Josh and I are getting ready to install the trunk floor in our 70 Cuda. Name of the game here is, we've got good quarters on the car, so we didn't want to have to cut those off to be able to do a trunk floor. So. We decided that we would drop out the frame rails, which you saw us do, and we took the trunk floor out. And now that those two things are done, all of the cleanup is done. You can see we even did the paint work and jam work up underneath there, all the prepping on the inner structure, which is all very good work. Thank you. So theoretically, we're supposed to take this little pan, go up in here. It's going to slide over the top of this pan. Is that right? Yep. And then push this up into place. Yep, on the back side. And then the plan will be to vice grip it into place just to hold it yes. so we can position the frame rails in because what you want to do is weld them all together as a unit. Right. Just like the factory would have done. Yeah, we'll drop it back on the jig, make sure the frame rails are in the right place, and then get it all welded up. You should do that. All right. Do that. Okay. So wish us luck. We make it look easy because that's our job. We're supposed to professionals make everything look easy, but it is not easy. And it's a lot of forethought and a lot of planning, like I had mentioned earlier. It's not the kind of thing I think that somebody would want to try in their garage for a multitude of reasons. One is we make it look easy and it's not. And another thing is that unless you have a frame jig that you can set these cars on, it's a bad idea just to jack it up on four jack stands and hope the car is level. Because if the car is not level, if it's not true, if you don't have X, Y, and Z on your frame measurements, then putting it together without those in place, you're gonna weld together a crooked car. So even though we make it look easy, there's a lot goes into making it look easy. Okay, I'm gonna vice grip mine into place, at least for right now, just to hold it. So what we'll have to do next is move the frame rails into place. Once the frame rails are into place, you'll begin to bring the, the slack out of it, right? You'll have right. to lower the car down and start bringing them together. But once we get the rails in, I should be able to cut you loose to be able to do that. And that'll be the final welding, right? Yep. All right, let's put some frame rails in. Sounds good. Okay. So now when you stand back and look at that car as a whole, you've got everything done the way Chrysler would do it, except that it just didn't start life as a six barrel car. The fender alignment to the door, to the rocker, to the quarter, to the cowl, to the hood, perfect. 
to the header. Perfect. Those don't happen by accident. The geometry of the car has to be perfect from the very first piece of foundation you put in to the very last piece of cosmetic metal that you put on. And if you do, if you take your time and you do it right, then nobody should be able to tell that you were ever there before. Nobody should be able to strip the paint back off of this car and say, wow, look at they welded here, they did this here. We want to make it look like it's exactly the way Chrysler did it. And when you stand back and look at that car, walk around it, you know that is a good, solid, straight, professionally done body that is now ready to move into the mudroom. Graveyard Cars is filmed before a live studio audience. Recently I watched a documentary about these guys who climbed Everest and it was pretty incredible. Like the, the just the, the willpower that these guys had to push through all of these hardships and I mean the, the, the weather, the limitations on them and I mean the, the, the human spirit and just the indomitable nature of the human spirit is it's incredible. And when you see it in action like that, it's, I mean, it's inspirational. It makes you think like, man, you could, you could do anything. You could, you know, climb the world's tallest mountain. You could, I don't know, you could run some fortune 500 company. You could ah, you invent something, discover something, be president. I mean, whatever, you know, it's the world's your oyster, right? At least, you know, that's, that's what they say. No way. No way. What are, you, what are you doing, kangaroo? Freckles! Oh no. You're not gonna... I don't want any part of this. Thank you very much. I know where this is going. So today's an exciting day. Brody's prepped it. He's going to come in here with me. We're gonna spray this together because we're kind of getting to that point where I want him to do more paint work and not just always be me all the, the time. What are you doing? <laughs> I love my job. I love it almost every aspect of it. Get done working, and I gotta go home. And there's Heather. Very sweet Heather looks at me and says, hey babe, how was your day? What do I answer? I, yeah, babe, I painted a car, primered some cars, managed my team. Oh yeah, and got jumped by a kangaroo. What? <laughs> what? What is this? I think we were all kind of in situations like that, right? You, you get, you're at a position, you look kind of look back and you think like, yeah, you know, school went well. Good GPA, good degree. That's what they tell you to do, you know. Do well in high school, go to college, get the degree, do that. Da, da, da. Get the good job, you know. Big corporate thing, producing something, you know. People are always amazed when you tell them like, you know, like what you do for a living and they're like, wow, so you actually do a job that is connected to the degree that you got. That's so cool. And it's like, yeah, that's, that, that's cool. That's really cool. There's a kangaroo chasing me. Ah!